Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. everybody. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser along with Tim Stenovic. And uh, <laughs> you're going to love this next guest. You're going to want, you're going to be like, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Because um, we have someone who spent her life. <laughs> John, you can do anything. Um, a really cool guest who spent, what, two decades uh, as a CIA agent um, and is writing about it. Yeah, she's so good at disguising herself that she once made her way into the Oval Office to meet President George H.W. Bush, the whole while pretending to be someone else. There was a reason she pulled this stunt. She was chief of disguise in the CIA's Office of Technical Service, and she was accompanying Judge William Webster, then the CIA director, to show off the new disguise capabilities of the CIA. Yeah, it's just one of the stories featured in her new book. Uh, I have to say we've been talking about it uh, in a lead up to this. The book is entitled In True Face, A Woman's Life in the CIA Unmasked. Uh, John Mendez spent more than 25 years as a CIA officer working all over the world, including in Moscow, Pakistan, Hong Kong, and more. She joins us from Reston, Virginia. Um, Jana, we are delighted to have you here with us. We were talking about the one time you disguised yourself um, making your way into the Ova office to meet with George H.W. Bush, uh, the whole time pretending to be someone else. We kicked it off there. Um, tell us about this stunt, first of all. We wanted to start there uh, and why you were doing this. Well, it's one of my favorite moments, so I'm, I'm always happy to talk about it. I was chief of disguise. Um, we had been working for years to come up with a totally animated mask, a mask that would actually work, that would you could talk, you could laugh you could smile and and we got there um <clears throat> and the very first mask that was made was an african-american man and it was made for me to demonstrate to various people and uh, it was it was good so i took it to my office director and he loved it and he said we're going to take it to the director of cia bill webster and he loved it and he said we're going to the white house and i said i i don't know if the secret service is, is, is gonna let me through because I look good, but I don't sound like a man, I don't walk like a man. So we did another one. Uh, I turned into another quite different looking uh, woman. Uh, we went to the White House, we went for the morning meeting. Uh, Brent Scowcroft, Bob Gates, John Sununu, it was, a, it was a good crowd, it was a quality crowd. And um, I was the first one that morning to brief the president. Uh, he had been, director of the CIA previously in another life. And I had a handful of pictures of him in disguise, which was kind of to relax everybody. And he's laughing <laughs> and he likes his pictures. I said, so I'm gonna show you the the, the latest, greatest, um, best thing we've got. And I said, I'll take it off. And I started and he said, well, well, no, don't take it off. Whatever it is, don't take it off. And he walked out around my chair and he's looking and he's peering and he's trying to figure out, is it a fake nose? He didn't know what I had on. Then he sat down, he said, okay, took off my mask and held it up so that he could see it was light as a feather. It was, it was the great reveal. Hey, beautiful. Jonna, um, we're going to get to the history of your career. I mean, there's so much here. We've got plenty of time with you, which is great. Um, but I'm just curious how much, if masks were that good in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when you did this, how good is the, how good, how much better is the technology now? Well, isn't that a good question? Because for many, many years, I never talked about masks. They were considered um, truly classified. And then it changed and we can discuss masks. I'm not really sure how that worked. It makes me think that they are no longer classified or they wouldn't let me talk about them. And that makes me think that we know you, we no longer use them. Why do you think that would be? Or at least we don't use the same thing that we were using then. Okay. So I don't know. Well, what, if let's say we don't use them anymore, why wouldn't we use them anymore? Is it because of biometrics and they've just gotten so good? You It'd can't be really because, fool someone. Yeah, be, because of cyber, because of of the incredible uh, technological uh, surveillance that's out there now. This ubiquitous 
technical surveillance everywhere all the time. Um, different materials act react differently to, to different light sources. So under IR, it might look good. Under ultraviolet, it might look like a dandelion. You don't know. I don't know. But the fact that I can talk about them tells me that they are they are no longer perhaps. How did you get your book? How did you get your book past the uh, the folks who I don't want to call them censors, but the approval process? The publication review board. Yeah. Um, How'd you get your book past them? Well, you cross the fingers on both of your hands. You remind them that by statute, it should be a 30 day review. It's never a 30 day review. And you just kind of distract yourself because it can take uh, it can take six months for them to finish, you know, looking at it. And they come back and they they say um, there are some things here that are still classified, and we're asking you to take them out. And um, this is our fifth book. We take them out. We don't want we don't want to put classified material in our books. There, there, it's I, I, yeah. it's not a light touch, yeah. but it's not nearly as severe as it used to be. Jenna, I think when we think CIA or a woman working in CIA, and I, I know it's not apples to apples, but for me, I'm like, is it Homeland? Is it like Homeland? Like, you know, you're running and you've got guns and you've got money and you've got all this. Like, what is it really like? Well, you won't like my answer because I didn't watch much of Homeland. That, all right. <laughs> the woman, um, Claire Danes. Yes, yeah. Claire Danes. She irritated yeah. me so much I couldn't keep watching her. <laughs> I will say. Watch the Americans. Okay. Okay, Give so, it another chance, though. It's a good show. Okay, okay. But <laughs> all right, so you watch The Americans. So, but what was it like to be a woman in the CIA? Well, A, it was, it was hard. Uh, if you wanted to be in the operational piece of it, and there were other parts of CIA where women had made good inroads, uh, the analytical part of it that women did uh, wonderfully as as analysts, science and technology. If you had a degree in chemistry or physics or optics or whatever, we would hire you. We would hire you at a lower grade than the men, but we would bring you in. But in operations, it was, um, that's overseas, that's feet on the ground, that's meeting with the foreign targets or the foreign assets if they agree to work with us. People who are truly often risking their lives to work for American intelligence. And the men just had this firmly fixed idea that those people didn't want to be working with women, that they wouldn't, that, that, that in, in many cultures, women yeah. have no credibility, that have no value. And they said, we can't, we can't put you out in the middle of that. It, it was this kind of big, it was vague, it was sort of menacing. It was like the women... Well, yeah, I can't I can't say what I said to them to hear on, on, on radio, but but I said BS, that is that's not true. These men it's always men. It was always men. These well, men are well, risking well, their lives. What would you say we've got about a minute and then we'll take a break and come back, but what would you say women bring to the table that men don't in this kind of situation? And again, we've got about a minute and then we'll come back and continue. Well, in that scenario, women have an empathy that I think men don't necessarily carry around in their hip pocket. The men are interested in training this foreigner in whatever the technology is that they're gonna to report to us. And they're very focused on the mechanics of that thing. Well, I can do the mechanics mm -hmm. as well, but I can also, I don't hold their hand, but I can reassure them, I can talk to them. There's a soft power that women can bring to these scenarios that has real value. Um, and I discovered over time, it has really good value. Um, I found myself a couple of times retraining people. You know, if, if I'm showing someone how this gadget works, and if he doesn't get it right away, he has no problem saying to me, a woman, can we run through that again? Whereas if it's one of my male colleagues doing the same training, hmm. he gets done, he says, got it? <laughs> the guy is going to say, yeah, I got oh, it. Oh, interesting. And maybe he didn't get it. I am still, I want to go back to how much of, you know, your career in the CIA were you, you know, in an office or meeting with, you know, an agent or a source or something. 
I mean, were there moments where you really were in danger? I'm just curious about that, because I think I hear CIA, and I, I know there's different levels, but I'm just curious about your own, since you were in some, some pretty serious spots, you know, uh, over the um, last few I'm decades. Yeah. I was in some situations that were there were certainly uncomfortable. I was in some situations that I think you you would call dangerous. Uh, not all the time. It, it didn't happen frequently, but when it happened, I had had so much training that I had a I had a very good sense of what I ought to do. Not that it would always work, but you know what I should try. That's a very vague answer to a kind of. <laughs> general question um there was some danger there mostly yeah. there was not mostly there was not um mostly well but it's so interesting because i think you guys you know when we talk to someone like you we get a peek into what the cia is like and what goes on behind the scenes and there's layers right in terms of gathering uh deciphering and you know utilizing intelligence yeah, I mean, the, the whole job is to bring back the information to American policymakers so they can make smart decisions. Uh, information on the plans and intentions of our enemies. Now, if you just glance around the world right now and wonder what is Putin planning? What are the Chinese going to do next? What about those Koreans with their nuclear uh, missiles? Um, you can imagine the kind of intelligence that our that our policymakers wanted and needed. Our job was to go find it, to find people who were conduits to that information, who could get it for us. We had all kinds of technology that we used. We had all kinds of tools that we could train them in. We had methods of their communicating that information to us where we didn't have to meet face to face, mm. which would really put them in danger. Typically, if we worried about danger, we worried about our foreign assets. They were the ones who were sometimes risking everything to work for us for a variety of reasons. It wasn't always money. They weren't always asking to be paid. A lot of them would work for us just for the promise that we would get their kids out of their country, get them to the West, get them educated over here. Uh, the motivators were always interesting. But whatever was involved to get the information was what we were um, about. Jonna, can you talk to us a little bit about Argo? Because as I was doing research about you, uh, I was struck that you co-wrote, along with your late husband, Antonio Mendez, uh, a book about the, uh, well, the hostage crisis. Canadian and, caper. Yeah, what exactly happened in 1979, 1980 mm. in Iran? and and your late husband's role, who, by the way, was he was portrayed by Ben Affleck in the film. Um, yes, he was. Take us back. I mean, I don't know what, what you were doing at that time, but what can you tell us about that whole experience, that whole event? I had nothing to do with Argo when it happened. I was, I was, uh, I was working in the same office, but because compartmentation is what it is, I didn't even know that it had happened. Wow. Um, wow, that says a lot, right? They, they yeah. started making that movie 19 years later, which, just to point it out, Tony kept that secret for 19 years, and he never intended to tell that story. George Tennant, the head of CIA, directed him to tell the story to the New York Times. It was a moment in history when it was quiet. Um, people were questioning, did we even need a CIA? And George Tennant, I think very wisely, decided to tell one good story of showing the value of the organization. Uh, Tony was gonna Tony was gonna go to his grave with that story. Mm. It was remarkable. When we got the call in the middle of the night that said George Clooney's gonna buy the story, the rights to the story, the next morning over coffee, Tony said, you know what that means? It means we gotta write the book because they'll move the story around, they'll change things a little bit. It won't be exactly 100%. And so we did that. We wrote the book, they wrote the script. And it's kind of interesting to compare them. Yeah. The, 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 the heart of the story is certainly there. But small things, like Tony was never separated from his first wife. Tony had three kids, not one. So his other two kids are still angry about that because they didn't get to be in the movie. Um, nobody chased an airplane down a runway in a Jeep with a gun. They added that or just a little flourish at the end story in the middle of, of going in and getting those six American 
uh, 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 diplomats and bringing them out. That's what happened. And, you know, we, we were in touch with, and I'm still in touch with all of them. We call them the house guests. Oh. They still, every once in a while, something comes up. We write notes back and forth. Who's doing what? Um, Tony probably saved their lives. And it was, um, it was just a moment. It was, it was, it was one, when he did it, it was just another operation <laughs> and it turned out to be so much more. Unbelievable. Did you ever get to go to the set? Meet Clooney? Pitt? Yes. F I? Yes. What was that like? Um, the opening scene where they're in the embassy and they're, they're trying to shred those documents and yeah, things out and everybody's, that took place at um, an abandoned VA hospital outside of LA. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, that's how, that's how they do it. And when we drove up to that, we drove up to that hospital, everybody was outside having a cigarette break. They were the actors, not the real people, the actors, but they were so closely modeled after the real people that Tony said they're, they're you know, he called them out one by one. There's Jessica, there's, wow. you knew who they were just from their clothes and their makeup and their hair. It was cool. Um, we just got 30 seconds. We could obviously, we wish we had longer, but we don't. 30 seconds. What do you hope someone who reads your book kind of takes away? And just quickly, forgive me. I hope it's a, it's a different look inside of the CIA. It tells you day to day what you might be doing, what kinds of operations you were supporting, what the pressures were, what the dangers were. Uh, it's a it's a very realistic look at, from a woman's point of view, doing the work. What was it like? And what was it worth? Well, it's not we just, thank you for that. It's not just it's yeah. for women. It's not what? Not, it's not just for women. No. A lot of men are going to enjoy reading this book. Well, we appreciate uh, getting a peek into uh, your life and your career and a peek into the CIA. Um, Jonna, thank you so much. Uh, Jonna Mendez, former CIA officer. Her new book is called In True Face, A Woman's Life in the CIA Unmasked. And she was joining us there from Western Virginia. You're listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, Tim Stanovic. This is Bloomberg. It is Bloomberg Business Week. Carol, we've talked a lot this month yes. about companies and climate change, thanks to the recent SEC approval of climate disclosure requirements for public companies. A quick reminder yes. for everybody, yes. the SEC will now force companies to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions for the first time, but the regulator is not going to force companies to quantify pollution from their supply chains or customers. That's known as Scope 3 emissions. We talked about it a lot on the program. Critics to um, the SEC rule who, who have said that um, it hasn't gone far enough. Have well, pushed back on supply this. chains are so important, right? Yeah. And the impact that they have certainly uh, on the environment. After all, carbon dioxide emissions are on track for one of the biggest increases in record this year, pushing the planet closer to catastrophic climate change. That jump, the result of human-induced pollution, uh, plus the El Nino weather pattern, which weakens the ability of the world's natural carbon to uh, sink uh, or sinks to absorb CO2. This is according to a forecast by the UK's Met Office. Uh, but our next guest is thinking a lot about sustainability. Yeah, and the role that businesses play when it comes to climate change. Uh, Judith Visa is a global sustainability officer of Siemens. It's the $152 billion market cap engineering, manufacturing, and tech company based in Munich. She's here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. Judith, how are you? I'm really well. Hello, you both. Hello, hello. <laughs> so uh, we'll get to all the, the nitty gritty in a minute, but I, just thinking big picture here, um, like in a world where there's so much bad news about climate over and over again, we're just, Carol and I are hit with it. We're almost desensitized to it. Although we, we would argue that we're seeing the actual implications of it more and more. Yeah, absolutely. In our days. Um, how do you think about the position that you have at a company that, you know, when we think about CO2 uh, and we think about carbon emissions, um, industry is responsible for a lot of it? Oh, yeah. I mean, industry accounts for about 29% uh, globally. Uh, add buildings to that, that's another 40%. Uh, you know, think transport, and, and then you're almost there. It's almost the whole pie. That's almost the whole pie. And we have enabling technologies that help from a decarbonization, resource efficiency in all of these areas. We work with industrial customers um, to digitalize, automate their manufacturing, think about product design and process design differently. Uh, but we also help with managing buildings and grids uh, to decarbonize those, uh, a tribute to, to energy efficiency. And of course, we're building trains. Yeah? And uh, what, what better tr ways of transport um, uh, to decarbonize the world than to get people to use trains. Well, and as we said, we're, I'm looking at our supply function on the Bloomberg when it comes to your company. You've got 
at least based on ours, I think it's like basically some of your biggest suppliers, some 84, 102 customers. I'm sure there's a lot more. Um, but again, I think it's kind of your major uh, on both the inputs and the outputs, if you will. Um, having said that, what really moves the needle in your view when it comes to, when you work with companies, when it comes to sustainability and, and how do we get to a point where we think about, let's not create the bad stuff so that we don't have to come how, somehow cover or you know, uh, quantify it. Not quantify it, but you know, kind of factor it out. Well, first of all, I, I think that transparency around data is actually uh, a huge advantage, yeah? and and we can talk a long time about. But if we're missing about... the supply chain, is that a problem? Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Of course, okay. of course. I mean, the, the scopes are there for a reason, and we're a signator of science-based targets. Um, we wouldn't have signed that if we didn't believe that all the scopes were important. And um, and we happen to be one of um, one of those enterprises that are actually not very energy intense in scope one and two. But for us, um, supply chain is important. Huh? We've got 65,000 tier one suppliers alone, which is quite complex for an enterprise um, our size uh, because of the, the many different things that we, that we do from make, a technology yeah perspective so that is important and then of course also how uh, our products deliver downstream you know, scope 3 downstream but for us it's also important to understand and help our customers understand what we can do for them in terms of abatement so last year alone we probably attributed about 190 million tons of abated emissions avoided emissions with customers um, so just away with them away with them and if i give you the other number for supply chain that's a, that's around about a 10 million um tons so so even though it's a, a little bit comparing apples with pears but you, just to give you the the magnitude of of the challenge you know in terms of w who we are in in terms of our supply chain but also what the technology can do for our customers how did you view the sec ruling earlier this month does it in your opinion not go far enough i mean how did we look in comparison to the EU, for example. Well, we're a DAX listed company, so we're listed in Germany. Yeah, so therefore, the SEC ruling doesn't affect us directly. Yeah, but um, but in Europe, uh, and I'm sure you know that very well, I, the the regulatory requirements are tough. huge. Yeah, are yeah. much much bigger than than anywhere else uh, at this stage. So, with, what's with, your view on how it looks in the US? I mean, is it kind of just like we're we're not even catching up? Well, I think every country needs to find their own way of, of you know, either either sending positive signals. And, and I think with the Inflation Reduction Act, you have done a lot in terms of positive investments into into clean energy and, um, and, and clean technologies. I think the EU has a reputation for being heavier on the regu regulatory side versus actually helping from an investment perspective. Mm. I think both is needed. Mm. I think both is needed at the end of the day. What, what holds it back, Judith? I mean, I grew up where there were solar panels on homes and they were taken down because they didn't sell. Um, I'm just curious, is what is it that is taking so long in terms of the transition and being better in terms of the output that still impacts the environment in a negative way? I mean, I'm thinking about coming off our summer here where we had orange skies, right? And mm. just, you know, I don't need to do the list. You're, you're very much aware of it. Anybody who's a global citizen is aware of what's been going on and it's different. So how do we move quicker and why don't we? A million dollar question, huh? because because one of the one of the good news bad news facts is that the technology to get us much more safely into twenty thirty is already there. It just needs rapid deployment. Huh? So why are we why are we why are we not doing it? Yeah. So I would say different different reasons. One is if I go Europe in comparison to the U.S., the cost of energy is probably twice as high in Europe as yeah. it is here. Was even higher, you know, when war in the Ukraine broke out. So the the return on investment uh, into anything that helps from an energy efficient perspective of course is huge in Europe yeah so mm -hmm. the the business case for investing into that is a better one um, than in by comparison than here on the other hand I think there are a lot of companies also here in the US who 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 basically take their responsibility very seriously and are trying to to do the right things when it comes to when it comes to climate change and then there is a lot of customers of ours who are in in business to consumer no? and yeah. uh, and of course there is a lot of um, of change in the perception of consumers around products that they would or wouldn't buy so but but I think all of these things take time and time is what we actually don't have and so therefore I think there is also a role to play for governments and community you know whether that's at, at a community level or at a national level um, to actually set the tone in terms of either the regulatory side 
and or, and, and this is obviously much preferable yeah, in terms of inducing an investment. Penalty tax, whatever, right? To kind of get us, you know, why do people have, you yeah, know, or incentives, say what, yeah, right? Or incentives, incentives exactly. Incentives, yeah. Good point, um, the positive side of the it. The positive side of things. Uh, 2024, an election year here in the US. Um, I think it's fair to say that the current president, President Biden, has a different view on climate change and sustainability than the presumptive nominee, former President Donald Trump. Um, does it matter to you as Global Sustainability Officer at Siemens, who the president of the U.S. is? Well, I mean, of, of course. Of course it is important, um, you know, who, who some of the, the big, big um, uh, players are in, around the globe. Huh? And, and we, we face a, a geopolitical situation that is, that is very different uh, right. to just five or ten years ago. But look, at, Z, at Siemens, we've been here for 160 years. Yeah? For 160 years, we have, uh, we have worked with, you know, the elected parties and the policy makers. And for us, I think that's, that's at the end of the day, the most important thing. It's, it's policy, not politics. Yeah, and we will we will work with. We've talked a lot about the difference <laughs> yes. of that over the last couple of weeks, but forgive me. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, and 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 so so I think for us it's it's more that yeah. What's what's going to happen uh, going forward? And at the end of the day, we're we're all in business, and I think we will do what makes business sense. And there is, in many regards, also a business case for sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've seen that um, uh, through a lot of bipartisan support as well. All right, great to have you here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Judith Visa. She's Global Sustainability Officer uh, at Siemens, joining us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. You're listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, Tim Stenovic, and this is Bloomberg.